welcome. You know the choice between a short or a long nail for an unstable trochanteric fracture. That's a common dilemma we face almost every day in practice, especially with our frail elderly patients. So in this explainer, we're going to critically appraise the evidence from a recent multi-center study by Tsugeno and colleagues, which directly compares these two implants for the AO slash OTT 31A2 fracture pattern. Here's how we'll break it down. We'll start by setting the stage with the clinical problem and the core question. Then we'll dissect the study's methodology before diving into the key findings. And finally, we'll interpret what these results really mean for us in the operating room and distill the most important clinical takeaways. All right, let's start by defining the problem. We are focusing specifically on the unstable A2 fracture. It's a pattern that presents a pretty significant fixation challenge, particularly in our geriatric patient population. As we all know, the AO slash OTA 31A2 is, by definition, biomechanically unstable. This is a very common injury in our elderly osteoporotic patients. Our primary surgical goal is pretty straightforward. We need to get fixation that is stable enough for immediate full weight bearing. That's absolutely critical if we want to minimize the complications that come from prolonged bed rest. Okay, so this choice between short and long nails, it's been debated for years. The whole rationale for using a long nail is purely biomechanical. The theory goes that it better distributes stress along the femoral shaft, which in turn could protect against secondary fractures, especially in that really poor quality osteoporotic bone. And that brings us right to the central question, doesn't it? Does this theoretical biomechanical benefit actually translate to better clinical outcomes for our patients? This is exactly what this study aimed to figure out. So now let's examine the study's methodology. You know, understanding how the research was actually conducted is crucial for us to assess the quality and the reliability of the evidence. So this was a multi-center retrospective analysis, and they drew from the Tron group database. The authors pulled out 174 patients over the age of 65 with this exact fracture pattern. From there, they created two really well-matched cohorts of 67 patients each, one group treated with a short nail, the other with a long nail and they were matched one-to-one -one for age and sex with a really striking average age of 87 years. Now we get to the core of the study, the results of this head-to-head -head comparison. Let's see what the data actually showed when these two implants were put to the test. Well, the first significant difference jumped out right there in the operating room. The long nail group required on average about 76 and a half minutes of surgical time. Compare that to just 51.6 minutes for the short nail group that 25-minute difference was highly statistically significant. And it wasn't just longer operative times. The long nail group also had a statistically significant increase in blood loss. We're talking more than double, in fact, at almost 107 milliliters versus 50 milliliters for the short nail group. But now, this is where it gets really interesting. Despite those significant operative differences, the key clinical and radiographic outcomes were remarkably similar. There was no statistically significant difference in one-year survival, functional mobility on the Parker score, or even pain scores. And critically, the rates of major mechanical complications like screw cutout were identical. And the sliding distance of the lag screw was exactly the same between the two groups. So what are we supposed to make of these findings? You have a procedure that's clearly more invasive, it's a longer surgery, there's more blood loss, but it seems to come with no apparent clinical benefit. This requires some careful thought. Well, the authors themselves attribute the increased operative time and blood loss directly to the technical demands of long nail insertion. And this makes sense. It includes the potential need for reaming the intramedullary canal, especially in our smaller statured patients, and the challenges we all know can come with getting those distal interlocks. And of course, we have to critically appraise any study, so it's important to acknowledge the limitations here. This was a retrospective analysis, which means the choice of nail was up to the surgeon. That introduces a potential for selection bias. Also, the one-year follow-up, it might not be long enough to capture some of those late complications like periprosthetic fractures. So let's translate all this evidence into some actionable takeaways, things we can actually apply on our surgical practice. The bottom line here is pretty clear. For this specific patient group with this specific fracture, those theoretical advantages of a long nail just didn't hold up. The clinical evidence showed no distinct benefit over a standard short nail. So this study gives us three key decision-making pearls for our preoperative planning. First, for this fracture, expect comparable outcomes no matter which nail length you choose. Second, 
If you do opt for a long nail, be prepared for a longer, more invasive procedure. And third, those theoretical biomechanical benefits, they just don't seem to translate into clinically relevant advantages for this patient population. And this brings us to a final, really important question for our own clinical practice. Based on this evidence, we have to critically reevaluate our indications for using a long nail for an isolated A2 fracture. Is there a specific patient or fracture characteristic that truly benefits? And maybe more importantly, does that potential benefit justify the increased surgical morbidity that was so clearly demonstrated in the study?